What's up, Aletheia family? Pastor Adam here. I'm so honored and excited to be with you today online. Grateful for you wherever you're joining us from. Uh, I'm coming at you not from my normal spot. I'm not at the church or I'm not in my office. I'm actually in my, my childhood home in Panama City Beach, Florida. Now, maybe you're wondering, Pastor, why in the world would you go on vacation and record a sermon? Well, I'm not really on vacation. Um, my, my family and I have been visiting some uh, ailing members of our family, and I know many of you have been praying for us on our travel, and, and we really appreciate that. But um, I actually thought it would be really interesting to preach this sermon from this place, because um, today we're going to be continuing our teaching series called With God, and we're going to be thinking specifically about how our walk with God is inextricably connected to the way we relate to each other. Now, in the first week, we talked about coming home to be with God. And last week, we heard a great sermon from Kevin McKenzie about about abiding with God and being in God's Word and praying and doing those practices. And today, today we're going to talk about how if we love God, that love must connect to love for one another. So join me, if you have a Bible, in 1 John chapter 4, starting in verse 7 all the way through 21. I'm going to read, we're going to pray, and God is going to speak to us. Let's go. Beloved, Let us love one another, for love is from God. And whoever loves has been born of God and knows God. Anyone who does not love does not know God, because God is love. In this, the love of God was made manifest among us, that God sent his only Son into the world so that we might live through him. In this is love, not that we have loved God, but that he loved us and sent his Son to be the propitiation for our sins. Beloved, if God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. No one has ever seen God. If we love one another, God abides in us and his love is perfected in us. By this we know that we abide in him and he in us because he's given us of his spirit. And we have seen and testify that the Father has sent the Son to be the Savior of the world. Whoever confesses that Jesus is the Son of God, God abides in him and he in God. So we have come to know and to believe the love that God has for us. God is love. And whoever abides in love abides in God, and God abides in him. By this is love perfected with us, so that we may have confidence for the day of judgment, because as he is, so also are we in this world. There's no fear in love, but perfect love casts out fear. For fear is to do with punishment, and whoever fears has not been perfected in love. We love because he first loved us. If anyone says, I love God and hates his brother, he is a liar. For he who does not love his brother, whom he has seen, cannot love God, whom he has not seen. And this commandment we have from him, whoever loves God must also love his brother. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Pray with me, God. Help my friends today, wherever we're joining from, uh, to, to learn what it means to, to love you well and love each other well with a, a, an empowered, hate-defying love. In Jesus' name, amen. Today we're talking about how our walk with God has to do with our, our relationships with each other. And there's never been a, a time where it's more important to talk about that and probably more difficult to talk about that. Because, because in this moment in which we find ourselves over these last months, we, we haven't seen one another and we've had um, a, a difficult political season and pandemic and all of these reasons churning to tear our love apart from one another. It's difficult to be a spiritual family, isn't it? It's hard. That's why in, in, in America particularly, we have hyper-individualized our own walk with Jesus. Perhaps you've heard about you know, my own walk with the Lord, my own spirituality, my own time with Jesus, my own relationship with God. I've accepted him as my personal Lord and Savior. But the scriptures are clear that if we are going to love God, we have to love one another. There's no loving God and hating one another. If we hate one another, according to John's words here, we don't love God. We we don't even know what that means. The Bible wants to make it really clear that life with God cannot be disconnected from life with one another, and that can be really hard. Even being in this home reminds me how hard that is for me. Family is hard for me. I I come from a home where uh, many of you would feel um, uh, familiar. It's a broken home. There was divorce and there was pain and there was sadness. And by God's grace, he's done so much in in my family and in my parents. And I'm grateful for that. But seeing these walls and these pictures and this furniture reminds me of some 
painful stuff, and hard stuff, little, little reminders, little monuments, little pictures of all of the good reasons that I have because of legitimate pain not to love, but in fact to hate. And some of you know exactly what that's like. In fact, right now you're like, okay, pastor, I'm all about that walk with God, but don't tell me I got to walk with other people. But I am going to tell you that because this word tells you that. But here's the cool thing. If we walk with God, we're called, we're empowered to have a hate-defying love for one another. Isn't that amazing? That with God, we're called to have a hate-defying love for one another. I can't think of anything more countercultural right now than the refusal to hate one another based on a legitimate offense or disagreement. In fact, this week, I, I released a, a new book. It's called Stop Taking Sides. And, and the book is all about how if we love one another and we, we orient ourselves lovingly toward each other and toward the scriptures, the more we walk with God, the more we're going to have to be stretched across difficult tensions, doctrinally or relationally, in order to love one another. There's never been at least in my life, a more important and a more difficult time to love one another. But I want you to hear this. We are called, I am called, and you are called to have a hate-defying love for one another because we are called to be with God. Let me show you what I mean. In verse 7 of this, in this chapter, it says, Beloved, let us love one another, for love is from God, and whoever loves has been born of God and knows God. Man, it's the thesis statement that if, if we've been born of God, if we've been born again, love is a non-negotiable virtue. It is, it is fundamental to God's nature, and it is to be increasingly reflected in our own natures. And, and that is both really encouraging, but also really, really convicting, because there have been times where I've not been as loving as I should have been, and, and, and it's the same for you too, because we're humans. But we can be. So in this, in this text, in our brief time together, I want to show you the, the paradigm for this hate-defying love, what, what the practice of it looks like, and how, how the Holy Spirit empowers us to do that. So, so let's see what this hate-defying love looks like that we're called to have as part of our life with God. Anyone who does not love God, verse 8, uh, does not know God because God is love. In this, the love of God was made manifest among us that God sent his only son into the world so that we might live through him. God's love for us is hate-defying. D- did you see that? You see, God's not asking us to have this hate-defying love for each other merely, but fundamental to the gospel itself is a God who has stepped over a legitimate offense that he had with us to love us beyond hate. In sin, I have offended God. In sin and rebellion, I have given him all of the good reasons to to hate Adam Mabry. That's the nature of our sin, that before Christ we were at war with him, but he loved us so much that he sent Jesus to step over that hatred, to bring it upon himself, all of the the brokenness and sadness and hatred of sin, so that he might orient himself lovingly toward us. That, That is the gospel paradigm for why we know him. Now, if that is fundamental to our gospel, it has to be fundamental to our relationships. We are called to have this hate-defying love because that hate-defying love is exactly the way God has loved you and I. And it doesn't just stop at defying hate, but at reconciling. Watch this. He says, if we love God, we must love one another. In verse 10, he says, in this is love, not that we loved him, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. That word propitiation comes from the the, the Greek word which means to satisfy or to make propitious. We're not talking about a God who's merely decided to forgive us, but a God who has forgiven us so that he might embrace us, family, if we have been reconciled to God. We must be reconciled to one another. That's the paradigm. It's so simple, but boy, it can be really hard. It can be really hard because we've been truly hurt and offended by one another. 
that's just the way it, it is. We're broken people and we, we are next to other broken people and, and sometimes our brokenness breaks them. We legitimately can offend one another and we give one another really good and legitimate excuses to hate us. And maybe you're watching this and you've had some legitimate excuses to hate others. But if you're called to walk with God, you're called and even empowered to be marked by a hate-defying love. So we've thought a little bit about the paradigm. It's a gospel paradigm. So what do those practices look like? Because that's really where the rubber hits the road. Watch what he says in verses 11 and 12. Beloved, if God so loved us, we ought to love one another. That, that is fundamental to the practice. So, so the normal in the church amongst the people of God is, I am to love you, you are to love me, we are to love each other with a love that's hate-defying, a love marked by the way God has loved me. But John is a human, and he knows that sometimes that's not going to happen. So watch what he says next. No one has ever seen God, but if we love one another, God abides in us, and his love is perfected in us. Now, John, what do you mean by that? How can the love of God be perfected? Well, the word behind the word perfected in the original text actually has to do with, like, completion. So what would it look like for the love of God to be made complete in us or perfected in us? It's as we pick up the practice of loving one another with this hate-defying love. And we give each other many opportunities to practice it when we offend one another. One of the worst things about being a parent, or about being a pastor or a leader in, in any way, is that you know you're gonna hurt the people you love sometimes. You're not gonna try to, hopefully, I, I don't try to, but sometimes you do. And then we find out where the love is. And then when, when you've been offended and you've been hurt, we, we find out, it, it is the love of God in me? And as we practice, Taking offense seriously and then reconciling to one another with this hate-defying love, that is precisely how God's love, the love with which He loves us, is perfected in us. Not that God's love needs perfecting, but His love in us needs to come to completion. And that, my friends, is the process of sanctification that can only happen in the church. So Jesus knew that you know, we would have a hard time doing this hate-defying love thing. So he, uh, he talks about this in, in Matthew 18. He, uh, he says uh, this in, in Matthew chapter 18, verses uh, 15. Let me just turn there for us. He says this. Now, if your brother sins against you, go and tell him his fault between you and him alone. If he listens to you, you've gained your brother. But if he doesn't listen, take one or two others along with you that every charge may be established by the evidence of two or three witnesses. If he still refuses to listen to them, tell it to the church. And if he refuses to listen even to the church, let him be to you as a Gentile and a tax collector. So what's Jesus saying? Hey, listen, if your brother offends you, go to him. Just you and him. Don't, don't put it on social media. Don't, don't let it out in a gospel. Like you, you just go to him and you say, hey, brother, this hurts. When you said this, this is how it made me feel. Can we be reconciled? And... 90% of the time, it works. Now, let's say that doesn't work. Then, then you go with, with someone else and, and the two of you, maybe, maybe your small group leader or a pastor or a mentor, and you say, hey, I need, I need your help reconciling to my brother. Okay. Now, usually that works if the first thing didn't work. But even if that doesn't work, then, then you come, come to the church. Then, then you get more of us involved. That's when you go to an elder, you go to a pastor, and we try to mediate something. And hopefully, hopefully that works. And only after all of that hasn't worked do we break fellowship with one another. And even when that happens, boy, it's to be done with, with e extremity. Why? Because that's how seriously God takes this command to love. Because we're called to love one another with a hate-defying love. Now I want to pause right here and ask you, is that how you've handled your offense? Is that how you've handled your pain? Is that how you've handled your challenges? Or have you taken them out on the internet? Or have you taken them out on gossip? Have you taken them out in rage to other people? We're called to have a hate-defying love for one another. And that's what it looks like. It looks like a Matthew 18 
process of, hey, when you hurt me, I gotta come to you. That means it, I have to be humble enough to admit I've been hurt. Some of you struggle with that. That means you have to be humble enough to hear, hey, you hurt somebody. And that's when we both have to remember. We're called to love one another with a gospel-shaped paradigm. And the practice of it is how the love of God is completed in us. So we've talked about this hate-defying love that marks the people of God. It's paradigm and what its practices look like. But maybe you're sitting there thinking, okay, Pastor Adam, that's hard. Yeah, it is. Which is why God doesn't leave us alone. He gives us power to do it. So this power he gives us to do it. Let's think about that now. He says in uh, going on from verses 13 to 18, we really get to see this power. And this is what it says. He says, by this we know that we abide in him and he in us because he's given us of his spirit. And we've seen and testify that the Father has sent the Son to be the Savior of the world. Whoever confesses that Jesus is the Son of God, God abides in him and he in God. So we've come to know and to believe that the love that God has for us, because God is love. And whoever abides in love abides in God and God in him. And this is the way the love of God is perfected in us so we can have confidence in the day of judgment There's no fear in love, but perfect love casts out fear. Fear has to do with punishment, and whoever fears hasn't been perfected in love, but we love because he's first loved us. If anyone says, I love God and hates his brother, he's a liar, for he doesn't know that uh, that love for his brother is required. You see, John wants us to understand, and God wants us to understand that life with him must change life with each other. This gospel-shaped paradigm of hate-defying love is put into practice as we walk with one another and and gospel love is our normal and, and reconciliation is our practice and it's only possible by the power of God the Holy Spirit. Now, let me say something really important. Walking in a reconciled way and loving one another well doesn't mean that you've not really been offended. Doesn't mean that the pain isn't real. I'm not talking about ignoring offense. That is abusive and wrong and And that's not what God does. In fact, the gospel takes our offendedness and the sins that we've committed against one another and against God so seriously that Jesus bled to ameliorate the consequences of those things and to reconcile us one to another. The gospel doesn't ignore sin or ignore abuse or ignore offense. It takes it so seriously that it is paid for and healed by the very blood of God himself. But since that's our gospel, reconciliation and hate-defying love is what has to mark us. That's the paradigm. That's the practice. And the power comes from God, the Holy Spirit. In Romans 5.5, 5, it says that God has shed his love abroad in our hearts in this way by giving us not just a gift merely, but the gift of himself, the same power that raised Christ from the dead, that overcame that offense, that, that hateful brokenness of death, so that we might overcome our hateful brokenness too. The Holy Spirit in you is able to give you the power to forgive and to be forgiven, is able to give you the power to reconcile and be reconciled. The Holy Spirit is able to cause in you enough humility to admit you've been hurt and to give grace to those who've hurt you. What does that look like? Well, John contrasts that with a very different experience, which is the experience of fear. Fear. He says, there's no fear in love because perfect love casts out fear. Some of you, you're like, Pastor Adam, I can't, I can't walk that way because I, I'm afraid of how they'll receive it. Or I'm afraid of letting go of my, my anger because it's real. And if I let go of it, then, then it's not serious. And, and I'm pretending like it's not real. Or Pastor Adam, I'm, I'm really afraid of letting them off the hook because you don't know what they did to me. I know that some of you have been hurt in ways that if we were to talk about it, we'd weep. And standing here in this room, I can remember ways I've been hurt that did cause me to weep. But this is love. Not that we have loved God, but that God loved us and gave his son to be the propitiation for our sins. Beloved, if God so loved us, we also must love one another. He gave us the Holy Spirit. Don't be afraid. Turn away from fear. Those fears, they're lying to you. 
because the, the gift and the blessedness of relinquishing fear and, and being reconciled and, and having shed abroad in your heart by the power of the Holy Spirit a hate-defying love means you get to abide with God. And that's what the series is all about. That's what the series is all about. The scripture says here, if anyone says I love God but hates his brother, he's a liar. Think about that sentence, my friends. In a time where we are taking sides, in a time where we are fighting, in a time where we are divided over issues of politics and, and a thousand other things and we act hatefully to one another, my Bible and your Bible just told me and you that if anyone says, I love God, but I hate my brother, I'm a liar. That's convicting. But John doesn't stop there. He says, For he who doesn't love his brother whom he has seen can't love God whom he has not seen. But this is the commandment. Whoever loves God must also love his brother. Do you know, if the sermon ended right here, maybe you'd feel inspired or convicted. But it wouldn't be a complete sermon. Because the amazing things about following Jesus is that he is the good brother who brothered us well. When we gave him every reason to hate us, when, when I gave him every reason to hate me, when I defied him, when I rebelled against him, when I, I lied to him, when I sinned against him, he loved me with a hate-defying love. It cost him his life as, as blood flowed from his hands and feet. It cost him emotionally as he was abandoned and mistreated and the victim of, of horrible injustice. And, and it was the very way by which God saved the world. What might God do through you and me if we let go of our right to offense and legitimate hatred and loved one another with a hate-defying, gospel-shaped, spirit-empowered, prophetic, attractive, God-glorifying, people-blessing love? I'll tell you what God might do. He'd change you. He'd change me. He'd change our neighborhoods. He'd change our families. Standing in this house, looking at these walls. I remember some great times and a lot of love. But because of the brokenness in my family, I can remember a lot of legitimate reasons to hate. But I have been loved by God. They hate to find love. And if I love God, I can't say I hate my brother or my sister or my mother or my father or my family or my, my citizens. And I, I, I can't do that. I got to let go of offense. I got to lay it before the Lord. I've got to embrace the daily practice of asking the Holy Spirit to give me the power to love others the way God has loved me. And I want to ask you, what do you need to do? Some of you have been really hurt and the idea of abiding with God, that sounds great. And a personal walk with Jesus sounds great. Reading your Bible a lot sounds great. And coming home to God sounds great. But loving God alongside some other people sounds not so great. I understand. I understand way more than I wish I understood. And yet, that's what we're called to do. How else is the world going to come together? Is it going to come together in politics? Is it going to come together in an election? Is it going to come together because of social media or because of some educational program? No. This love, this gospel is the hope of the world. And it's your hope too. So, so here I want to challenge you to do a couple of things. The first thing I want to ask you to do is take stock. Where are you offended? Don't, don't, don't be afraid to admit to yourself, like, yeah, I'm angry at this person, or I'm offended at this person. We always spiritually, no, no, no I'm not offended. I'm just a little bothered. I'm not, I'm not hurt. I'm just, you know, I just don't prefer them. Don't, don't do that. Don't, don't put a euphemism, a nice-sounding church label on what is raw pain. Just say it. God already knows. He's just waiting on you to figure it out. Take stock. Where are you actually hurt? Where are you harboring unresolved offense? Do you see any of these symptoms in your own relationships where you love God, but you're like, and you kind of have hatred toward one another? God wants to heal that and abide with you in a greater and greater measure by means of his love being perfected in that imperfect relationship. How about this? Tap into the Spirit's power. Holy Spirit, 
Where do you want to challenge me? He's challenging me. He's challenging me in the season. I'm sure he's challenging you. How does he want to challenge you and empower you? You can't do this alone. The whole point of the gospel is that we needed help. And because we've been loved with this hate defying love by Jesus, and he's given us the same spirit that enabled and empowered all of that, he, he wants to empower it in you too, man. So what do we need to ask him to do? What do you need to ask him to do? Is it, is it in you? Is it in your small group? Where in our church family do we want to see God do this? Because we want to see it happen together. We're going to come out of this pandemic. We're going to come out of this recession. We're going to come out of this moment more like Jesus and more postured to see his hate-defying, all-embracing, spirit-saturated, blood-bought love change the world. But it won't change the world until it changes me and you. And finally, the question is, what step do you need to take today? You need to join a group. Maybe you need some pastoral counseling. You need prayer. Let us know in the chat. We'd love to pray for you. We'd love to talk with you. We'd love to connect you. If you need mediation, if you're like, I don't know how to reconcile here. I need some help. Man, we're the church. We'd love to help you. Because you've been loved with a hate-defying love. And so have I. And if we're going to walk with God, we've been called and empowered by Jesus through his spirit to love one another with the same hate-defying love. I love you, church, and I'm so excited to see the way this love grows up in us, amongst us, and for the world. So I'm going to pray that over us now. God, help us love one another the way you've loved us, with a hate-defying, spirit-empowered, 